Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Best of Pedal Shift. We're releasing this a touch early because I've got some good news. If you are getting this the day of release, I'll be appearing on a live stream tonight, Wednesday, September 16th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time over on the Path Less Pedals YouTube channel. So it is a nice coincidence that that is happening the same day that I am putting out the best of pedal shift number 109 featuring Russ Roca of, ta-da, the Path Less Pedaled. This was a conversation Russ and I had back in March of 2018. Remember 2018? We talked about the evolution of the pathless pedal, where it began from, and the types of techniques that Russ uses in his filmmaking. And of course, we talk about touring on Bromptons because, well, I learned a lot from their channel. If you're not familiar with Russ, Russ Roca is one half of the pathless pedal, along with his partner, Laura. That is one of my favorite resources for bike travel. Since the early aughts, as Russ calls them, he has used photography, video, and writing to advocate the joys of bicycle travel. From extended bike tours across the U.S. and New Zealand to making Brompton's work for bike touring and working for state and local agencies to promote bicycle travel. Russ is a true leader in this field, and I'm really excited to share this interview with you. And a quick reminder, if you want to join us live, we'll do Q&A. That'll be tonight, if you're hearing this when it comes out, Wednesday, September 16th, 2020, over at the Path Less Pedals YouTube channel. But if you can't make it live, no worries. You can check it out after the fact over at the channel as well. I am joined here on the Pedal Shift Project with Russ Roca from the Path Less Pedaled. Russ, thanks for joining us on the Pedal Shift Project. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've been enjoying your podcast immensely, so I'm stoked to be on the well, show. Well, I have to say, I've been enjoying all of the stuff that you've been doing for years and your brand new podcast. I definitely want to talk about that later on. But you are one of the the pioneers in sort of like getting into the social media aspects of bicycle touring. And I wanted to really kind of take a deep dive into all of that. But first, I wanted to kind of get a little bit of background for you. In 09, you and your partner, Laura Crawford, sold your stuff. You began a three-year bicycle touring journey in the U.S. and New Zealand. Bring us all the way back then. And how did you get, you know, how did you get from your life before that big tour to making that big leap? How, what was the decision-making process for that? It's interesting. I think a lot of bike blogs and bike personalities started in that like mid 2000s. And we were part of that um, kind of just generation, uh, early bike bloggers. And that's when I discovered bike commuting in Los Angeles. And uh, slowly we started doing overnight tours. We got exposed to Rivendell and really latched on to that idea. And then uh, one time in like 2008, we did a, a two week tour in Joshua Tree. And afterwards, we were like, whoa, this is so much fun. I wonder what would happen if we didn't go back home. Um, and then 2009 happened, and then we saw the big economic downturn, right? Laura caught wind that, um, you know, that there's going to be some organizational reshuffling in uh, where she worked. And at the time, I was doing photography, so I just kind of kept booking shoots, booking shoots, saving, saving, saving. And once she got the final word that she was going to get laid off, I kind of just set things in motion, put up a website, and decided that, you know, this is as good a time as any that we weren't going to miss out on any big economic boom. Uh, so this <laughs> it was a good time to, to learn how to live light. And uh, what was funny was like a lot of people did that that year. Like we did, I think we rode a portion of the, the Pacific Coast and we met so many people. One guy who was a programmer from Florida, biked to Alaska, was going down to Argentina. Lots of people had that that same experience that year. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Uh, I think that in times of stress in our country, Art and creativity really takes a big uptick. And so, yeah, you saw a lot of really cool stuff come out of that time. What, what, at what point, it sounds like you had kind of an idea that it was going to be happening um, and had a little bit of a plan going into it. Did you have what the Pathless Pedal was all kind of figured out before you kind of went tires to the road? Or did this just sort of develop as you went? Uh, it was all really organic. Like, um, I think probably from... The moment that we committed to when we left was a span of like four months, mm. <laughs> which is, I think, in retrospect, the best way to do it. Because if you give if you have too much time to think about it, there's lots of ways to talk your way out of it. But because since the turnaround time was so quick, we just got rid of everything, didn't really think about it. And originally it just began as a, a personal blog you know, to kind of document the adventure for ourselves. We had no like intentions of 
turning into a brand, the business, and all these other things that it's it's become since then. So it was really just like, you know, we're doing this thing, and I want to remember it and record it for myself. And it was kind of early days. You know, there was, I believe, a crazy guy on the bike. There was maybe a couple of other bike tourists, like, blogging about the experience, but nothing to the scale that we see today. <laughs> so I feel like we were able to kind of capture a lot of that early market where, where people were interested in it. What was the production level like back then? Uh, you know, obviously technology has really increased a lot. What was sort of your your gear going out? Was it just iPhone and it? It was heavy. <laughs> I think we both had a really romantic notion that we'd be able to work on the road. So at the time, Laura was making head badges and uh, jewelry. So she carried a, a bag of hammers and silver and saws and everything. And I had this notion that, you know, I do food photography and portraits. And that's something that every, you know, town needs. So I actually traveled with uh, two light stands, a softbox, I had a big laptop computer, a DSLR, a bevy of lenses, uh, strobe, strobes, umbrellas. Uh, so it was not ultralight by any means. <laughs> uh, I mean, and partly the, the technology wasn't there, you know, like the whole mirrorless camera, hybrid cameras that did both uh, video and stills really well didn't exist. Uh, so I was using kind of the tools at the time. And also the the mediums of the time. Like, I don't think, um, I think maybe some people were vlogging back then or, or creating video content, but not not enough. Um, so definitely our, over the years, you know, I think the technology and the ways that we tell stories has changed given with given what's available. Did you have any, uh, um, shall we say, camera loss during that time? Because there's one thing that I've learned is that the vibration on the road can really mess up, <laughs> mess up your gear. Did you have any early losses? Actually, everything held up surprisingly well. Like I padded everything in lots of sweaters and shirts. <laughs> uh, so that did well. I ironically, one of the things that uh, I did carry with me was a field recorder and a shotgun mic. Like back then I wanted, I had this notion of doing, um, you know, stills with audio under, underneath it. So like, kind of like an audio slideshow. So like basically a podcast with still images. Um, but I, I couldn't quite wrap my head around audio editing back then. So at some point I, I ditched that and just went for the photography and the writing. And it's, it's funny to, to, to rediscover that in a way. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. How do you think that your writing and, and your video and your photography work has evolved since you first started? It, it, has the road sort of and all these trips informed how you approach all of this? Yeah. So I think initially we we focused a lot on ourselves and what we were thinking. But I feel like the longer that we were on the road, I was more interested in the stories of other people and how that all tied together. So there's definitely a, sh a shifting of the lens from you know, us complaining about the weather, not having food to kind of trying to capture um, the stories of people we interacted with. And I'm totally glad we did that because that, you know, that's almost, you know, eight years ago. And the things that I remember most are those human interactions rather than like the scenery and, you know, it was cold at night. Um, so I think definitely like the longer time we spent on the road, the more re we appreciated those, those human interaction. Over the years, you've built Pathless Pedal into a really great resource for bicycle travel. You've partnered with uh, state tourism boards, for example, and a bunch of different companies and stuff like that. But I wanted to focus a little bit on sort of these broad-based state tourism boards and other groups like that. How have you find working with those big tent organizations that are interested? They're interested in bike tourism. Otherwise, I wouldn't hire you guys. But it's probably a really small overall part of their mission. How have you found kind of that balance with them? I think the our most successful partnership has been with Travel Oregon around the Oregon Scenic Bikeways. And uh, we've worked with other state level organizations like uh, Idaho and Iowa, a little bit with Mississippi. And for like those were long courtships. <laughs> like I feel like most state tourism organizations, you know, view cycling as a as a niche, um, you know, of, of varying degrees. But it's usually through a lot of emails or we meet meet these people in conferences and and we're constantly making the case. We do a lot of speaking at both bike summits and tourism conferences. Uh, so we kind of have to do a lot of convincing. Um, but at the same time, you know, they do all these destinations see bicycling as an important uh, kind of market segment to grow. I mean, they, they realize that people are, are biking in their state, their region, uh, that these are great travelers to have because, you know, they eat a lot, they drink a lot and they, they behave, you know, they're pretty tired at the end of the day. 
And also for a lot of these destinations, um, especially ones with lots of rural areas, like they don't have to develop a lot. You know, it's different from like you know, developing, let's say, uh, a trail of golf courses. You have to build that physical infrastructure. But for bicycling, you really just need basic hospitality. Um, you know, actually the fewer kind of things you have, the better because there's generally less traffic. So as long as there's decent roads to ride, paved gravel or trail, and there's a place to stay and there's a place to eat, then almost any destination can kind of, you know, frame itself as a, as a bicycling destination. I mean, there's, there's leveling degrees of success. Um, but I think most destinations we've interacted with understand that, yes, they could do it. Um, you know, that, that it's, it's something that they should explore in the future. Have you run into any resistance from any of these types of organizations that you've chatted with? I mean, obviously, if you work with them, they're open to bicycle tourism and whatnot. But I'm curious what your strategies have been for talking to folks that are a little bit more resistant to, resistant to the idea, to the economics behind it, things like that. What's interesting is like, I actually find the tourism industry a lot more open minded uh, in many ways than the than the tr- traditional bike advocates. I feel like when we do uh, speak at conferences. We have to do a lot more selling to what I'd consider traditional bike advocates uh, in that space rather than uh, tourism people because they they're always looking for you know the next trend a new way to get people into their area so they're they seem fairly open minded um, you know we can show them you know many states have different studies so we we'll usually you know give that in the presentation um, and one thing that we've been doing uh, a lot the last eight years is recording lots of interviews. So we'll record, you know, people that were skeptical about bike tourism, uh, but then started the business along the trail and saw how it was a big economic boom. Um, you know, we'll, we've uh, interviewed you know, city managers that uh, in the Midwest that have embraced gravel grinding, uh, but were first kind of wary, but then saw like this huge event brings people, you know, to these places that people would just fly over, but now we're visiting on purpose and even year round. So we have all these interviews. And just we, pre- we present lots of good case studies. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That seems like a good way to do it. Yeah. It's one thing for us to say, yeah, you should do you should get into bike tourism because it's awesome. But then it's it's another thing to have like a primary, um, you know, primary source of someone else saying, yes, you know, I was kind of on the fence, but it's it's actually a thing and it's benefiting me and the community. Do you find that your role as an advocate for bike travel, bike tourism has changed over the years? Has, has there been a different kind of focus in in recent years than compared to when you started? Because I, it feels like we're in the middle of some kind of a change. I'm not sure if I can put my finger on what that is, but it feels like something's happening. Yeah. You know, early on, like I think our, our mission, if we had a mission, was to get individuals uh, excited about bike travel. But then I feel like there's a lot of people doing that now. Like with there's, you know, we don't need to fill that 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 segment, but um, you know, there's still work in kind of working with the destinations to get them ready to receive all these people that are stoked on bike travel. So that's where we've kind of shifted our efforts. Um, <clears throat> in terms of kind of specific things like you know, gravel is big. You know, off-road bicycle touring, bike packing, uh, whatever you want to call it. You know, there's a big emphasis on that at the moment. Um, but I also think like Another thing we'll see in, um, you know, that, that, that's always existed, but we'll probably see more of is kind of just like destination based cycling. So, uh, you know, base camping at one place and doing loops. It might be, might do a paved route one day and then the gravel loop the other day. Um, you know, so, so what that looks out, what that looks like in terms of, uh, bicycle touring. Cause I feel like over the years, like our, the kind of bike travel we like to do has changed. You know, we used to like to do the, the the long distance kind of self-supported, but then now we're actually all about like these small regional explorations because you get to really, you know, dig your teeth into a place and get a, get a sense of the area. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the evolution of even just the the bikes that you've ridden in the past. And actually, maybe I'll just skip ahead because I've been dying to talk Bromptons with you for, oh, I don't know, forever. <laughs> so yeah. let's, let's, let's get into a little bit about Bromptons. I mean, I, people who listen to my show know I'm a full believer in touring on, on uh, Bromptons and the capabilities of the bikes. Um, in fact, uh, I'm going to announce on the live show tomorrow as we record uh, that I'm going to be doing a Puget Sound little mini adventure a few days after this podcast gets uh, cast out to the world. But back in 2011, you and Laura did a big tour on Bromptons and ended up writing the unauthorized Brompton Touring Guide, which is actually pretty cool. I'm curious, 
Like, what got you directed towards Bromptons? And because it doesn't seem like you are riding them as much, have you become less enamored with it as a touring vehicle? Or is it just you're more interested in some of these um, rides that you just described, the the kind of hyper-local ones, where maybe a Brompton wouldn't be so great, like, say, on gravel? Yeah, so we got interested in Bromptons uh, at the end of our kind of uh, tour with the long haul truckers because we found ourselves using, you know, transit a lot, you know, hopping on the Amtrak or uh, kind of a regional train. And with a large size bike with a traditional loading set, it just became like a pain in the butt. Um, so we're like, oh, there's got to be a better way. And then um, you know, we had a friend that, that had toured in Brompton. I was like, eh. I never really took it seriously until we had all these terrible train experiences. <laughs> And then I started looking at the gearing and I was like, you know, you can get up actually pretty close to like, you know, uh, a triple. Like if you if you space, if you gear it right and you pack less, like broad picture gear range would wouldn't be too dissimilar. And also, you know, at that time you know, we wanted to pack lighter and the Brompton definitely has like, I feel like a more strict weight limit. But also, um, you know, one of the things that we've always fought against is kind of you know, existential gear less, like what do you actually need to tour? And I thought, you know, touring the Brompton with just six speeds and these like unlikely small tires would be a perfect example of like, you know, you can actually tour on any bike. <laughs> so it became kind of, you know, we wanted to prove it to ourselves, but also show other people that, you know, any bike is, you know, can be an adventure bike, you know, given, you know, the right circumstances. Um, and we really wanted to to strip the focus away from from the gear specifically to to storytelling and just having having fun on the bike. Uh, so yeah, so we did that. We we toured initially from like Portland to I think we started in Bend, went up to Glacier, then went overseas to New Zealand for three months and, and toured on Brompton. And at the end of that, wrote the the unauthorized Brompton touring guide, uh, which was fun. And it is unauthorized because we like it, during that time we were in contact with Brompton engineers. And they're like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I, I'm curious. I've been giving you guys credit for the uh, the backpack hack. Was that your idea? Or did you find that out from some other folks? I think when we were doing research, I saw some people kind of do that. But it was kind of, you know, it was like early days, you know, on Flickr, like you kind of saw a hint of it. But no one was, was really explaining it well. So we knew that it could be done and then just had to figure out a way like where it makes sense. So, OK, so how do you actually attach the dowel to the back of the saddle and, you know, how do you secure the backpack after it's it's, it's on there? Um, so we did see other people do it before, but I think like, you know, we made videos about it and clearly the book about it. So it kind of spread that message a lot better. Well, I have to tell you, the video that you did, I don't know if you get like 10,000 hits a day off of this thing, but you should <laughs> because it really made a huge difference for me to be able to kind of wrap my head around how to get a backpack to work on the rear rack. So thank you. Um, I've been meaning yeah. to say that for a very long time. Um, I'm curious because I get this all the time when I'm riding with my touring setup, which is not dissimilar to what you guys did. Did you get like everybody asking you if you were going to be popping a wheelie going up hills? Because literally every day I get that when I'm riding on the touring setup. And I don't know why it annoys me so much, but for some reason it does. And I'm curious if you had the same experience. Uh, we didn't get that so much as we did like, oh, do you have to pedal faster because the wheels are smaller? Or if whenever, you know, we didn't have stuff on the, the bike, people just would like lift it up to see if it was like any lighter than a regular bike. <laughs> Um, but yeah, definitely it raised a lot of eyebrows and, and questions. Um, it was cool. It was cool to, to, to show people what, what's possible. You yeah. Know? And, and that was my favorite part too, was just, I mean, I didn't, I didn't mess around. I went straight to Big Sur the first time I did it. And, you know, oh, to yeah. be able to take those hills and to climb those climbs with that little clown bike, as I affectionately call it, was just, <laughs> it was really exciting. And, uh, the setup that you guys talk about in your book just really worked really well. So I, that's why I want to plug the hell out of that thing because it really does a nice <laughs> job of giving you the option to have a not insignificant amount of stuff. I mean, I think you're right. You, you have to pare your gear down, but you, I mean, I'm carrying a full size tent. I'm carrying all of my sleeping kits and everything like that. You know, it's, it's pretty remarkable what you can get on that bike. Um, especially if you can do something on the front with that luggage block as well. Yeah. I loved it. I love like what, what I still really love about touring with the Brompton is um, it lets you skip all the crappy parts yes. by using transit, you know, and in particular places that aren't outfitted to carry full size bikes. So in New Zealand, 
there's some great areas of riding, but there's also lots of terrible areas. But they had all these tourist buses that could kind of teleport you to the better riding areas. But they didn't have bike racks. But because we could fold the Brompton, Brompton up and, and toss it below in the luggage compartment, you could, we could skip those crappy parts and get straight to the good parts. Did you ever run into any situations where there were bike racks on the front of the bus and the driver made you put it on the front rack? Yeah, we did in New Zealand. Like he tried really hard. You're like, dude, it's not going to work. Like the wheelbase is too short. It's too short. You know, it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's going to fall off the front. And it took some uh, convincing. And uh, I think we you actually had to like just show how absurd it would be. Like we could toss it in the back. Yeah. Um, Pretend yeah. it's a stroller, <laughs> sir or ma'am. <laughs> yeah. I, I also feel like that might have happened once in Oregon taking the the bus to Tillamook. Like maybe he they wanted us to put in in the no 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 it was um it was a bus to to Ben from Portland they they actually were really anal you know, about you know us taking the Brompton they wanted us to put it in the full size bike box which was absurd <laughs> I've heard that the Ben to Portland uh, bus is is extra strict whereas the Tillamook folks they're like eh third bike sure throw it in the back kind of a thing yeah yeah that bus is not my favorite like we've worked on them I've we tried to get Travel Oregon and put some pressure on them. But the thing is, like, they see themselves as an airport shuttle right. from, for people going from Bend to Portland and less like, um, you know, something for, for tourists. So. That is a missed opportunity right there, right? <laughs> 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 one of, you'd mentioned storytelling earlier in our chat, and I think that's one of the things that makes your work so much more dynamic is to weave in elements of storytelling. Do you, when you are going off on any of these, any of these types of trips, whether it's a, a when you're hired for or one that you're doing on your own, do you go in with an idea on how to weave in a story or do you mostly let it come to you through the lens as you go along? It's shifted, I think, initially over time. Um, I think initially, like, I was like, oh, we're just film what happens and, you know, make a story out of it. But that's not very conducive to, <laughs> to good storytelling sometimes. So usually when we go out on a trip, I'll have like a rough narrative arc. And, you know, a story has a beginning, middle and an end. So definitely, you know, film a piece of camera in to, to set it up. Like, what's the beginning? What's the purpose? Like, I'm not a fan of those videos that you see that are kind of rambly and don't have a purpose. So I like to state that right up front. Okay, we're going to take Amtrak. We're going to ride going the Sun Road. So there, in, in that way, it's planned. But I do leave it open to kind of film those interactions, but all the, all the while, like, kind of self-editing in my head for the narrative arc. And definitely at the end, you know, put a cap on it just so that there's that sense of closure. So uh, it's a balance of both. Like, one... Some video kind of framing the experience so the viewer knows what to expect. Um, being open to what the experience happens in, in the middle, but then also like closing it off at the end. Cool. Have you ever thought about doing any kind of larger scale projects like uh, full documentaries or anything like that? Because I feel like that you're more than equipped to be able to do such things. I have, but not on our personal uh, tours. Like uh, if, if we were to do one... <clears throat> We've we've we have had like a documentary project in mind for a very long time, trying to pitch it to various people like adventure cycling and people for bikes, but no one's really bitten. But it would be about this idea of rural economic development and bikes mm. through through bike travel. You know, so telling that story of, you know, what the uh, you know, ACA routes have done, you know, what certain bike packing routes have done, what gravel rides have done to these rural areas. Um, that, that were maybe kind of skeptical of bikes, uh, maybe slightly anti-bike, but then after being exposed to cyclists, um, you know, have changed their minds and have become welcoming of bikes. So I feel like, you know, that's where a lot of maybe resistance comes from. And we need those voices to be uh, at least supportive of bikes. And no one's really capturing that. And I think that's kind of, you know, a lot of traditional bike a advocacy focuses on kind of dense urban centers because that's where, you know, bike commuting makes sense. But rural areas can also benefit from cycling. It's it's but it's completely different concerns. And we have to address those and kind of work work that into the, the message as well. Yeah, so that, that would be you know a docu documentary project we want to do for us. I'm, for our travels, I'm kind of actually content with short short form, just like kind of snack size uh, adventures. Um, just because I feel like, you know, you go too long on a on, on any kind of bike travel narrative, it ends up being uh you know complaining about the weather or a hill or something uh rather than like kind of interesting i don't know like interactions 
Yeah, it's funny because, I mean, in order to have a good dramatic story arc, you know, hero's journey, Chekhov's bike, I guess we'll call it, you know, it's sort of like you don't know you're always going to have that kind of stuff. So, you know, a lot of bike tours are frankly just a lot of cycling and it's beginning and end and that's about it. So you just never know. But uh, when you do get those kind of moments, it's always kind of fun to be documenting them. I think it's easier to have like a more sharply focused story in a smaller trip, you know, like either, you know, riding around the route or, you know, riding to a particular destination, then you can kind of wrap your head around, you know, what that narrative would be rather than something so long and open ended. I think that I have seen some drone footage in some of your stuff. Have you been getting into drones? What, what, what do you think about what, what are you using these days? And what do you think about it in the realm of uh, using it to document a bike tour, whether kind of at the scale that you guys do it or, what, you know, somebody out there who's just like, hey, I'd like to send a cool shot of me biking on this trail back home. I really have mixed feelings about drones. I can imagine. Uh, we have them and we use them, but we were actually, I was kind of dragged into using them because I feel like they're kind of crutches for storytelling. Mm. You know, they're good like eye candy to suck a viewer in, but I, I feel like they tend to be overused and they don't really add to the narrative. I mean, like you can maybe use it in the beginning to have an establishing shot, maybe at, you know, some kind of climax when you hit a peak. But then that's all, you you know, I don't want, you know, a drone shot of you eating something or. (laughs) (laughs) So like I I use it, but I use it sparingly. Um, We have a a couple, we have two drones, one uh, for paid work, which is a Phantom 4. And then for our personal stuff, we'll use the Spark, the little small one. Um, You get about 11 minutes of flight time per battery. So, you know, you (laughs) you have to be really purposeful about how you use it. Um, I think it's a tool. I think it gets overused. Uh, actually, a lot of our recent vlogs, I've just been using a, a GoPro because I really wanted to strip away like you know all the technology and see if I can just get away with like pure narrative and what that would look like. Um, you know, but depending on the ride or or what we're doing, I'll, I'll use a drone, but it's not it's not my primary tool. I feel like a lot of people are using the drones because they're like. If I hauled this thing all the way out here, <laughs> I am going to use it. I'm going to drain every <laughs> ounce, every last electron out of that battery and get tons of shots. So I, maybe that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a quick. Well, I would say quick. It it it's a accessible way to, to increase the production value of any video. You know, like I feel like it's like boom. Oh, that it's it's, it's cool looking, uh, but I feel like a, um, many bike videos kind of over over rely on. The drone, you know, and like most, like many, um, I'm a big consumer of bike video media, <laughs> both as like a creator and just like a, a, a critic. And, um, you know, there a lot of videos have no story. It's like beautiful footage of music, which is cool to watch, but then it feels like empty calories after a while. It's like you're not, you know, giving me any beta or information or sucking me in. Um, you know, you're kind of feeding the eyes, but not I don't know, the soul. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to have something to say and, and to, you're, you're communicating. It's sort of be like doing a podcast and just sort of, you know, reading from a phone book. You know, you, you want to be able to yeah. at least communicate something. I want to talk a little bit about uh, relationships because uh, the kind of preamble to this is uh, I think I think I've talked about this on the pod. I spent about three months in an RV for my girlfriend's uh, book tour a few years ago, and it was 19,000 miles. And uh, I found the dynamics of traveling in that small space really eye-opening she does not bike tour so um you however have ridden with your partner for a lot longer than that and i'm curious what kind of advice or insight that you've gotten over the years traveling with laura and um advice for folks who are going to be traveling with their partners on bike tour because i have a ton of listeners who have that exact dynamic uh yeah not only did we travel together but we've you know we've operated pathless pedaled as a business together uh pretty closely. And I mean, one of the first things to go is privacy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think acknowledging that although you love each other, you know, it's okay to have like quiet downtime at the end of the day. You know, you don't have to have that intense uh, kind of uh, conversation all the time because you're seeing the same thing. So that was a weird thing to like to, to be so close, but then actually talk less sometimes at the, at the end of the day. But, but realizing that that's okay because we've had so many shared experiences. Um, so that, and, and, uh, I think early on, we really kind of figured out what our individual strengths were. So there was like a little bit of a division of, of labor, like, okay, I would do these tasks and Laura would do these tasks and then kind of respecting those. Um, so I think those would be the, the, I mean, 
like understanding that you're not going to be talking all the time and that's okay is like a big part of it. <laughs> I, I totally hear you. And that's almost exactly what I would say. I'm the extrovert of our, of our relationship and she's the introvert. And one thing that I had to learn was that having that quiet time at the end of the day, it wasn't her being mad at me. That wasn't anything like that. Yeah. That was <laughs> that was just reality and just how our, we, we uh, operate differently, even though we've been together for 14 years now so it's been it's yeah. been a it's been a while it's been a while do you like traveling solo do you find that that scratches an itch that's different than traveling with laura um hmm don't worry nobody's listening to this <laughs> <laughs> i mean i feel like i like traveling with laura the best because when i travel solo i'm always thinking oh laura would really dig this you yeah. know so it almost kind of defeats the purpose <laughs> i'm always like filtering it uh, the experience through my eyes of like, oh, I want to bring Laura back here. So I, I definitely, I, I think I, I mean, I'll do a solo trip, but it somehow feels less fun for me. Is she, you're, you're, you've gotten into uh, uh, fishing or at least maybe you've always been into fishing, but at least I've been noticing it more in the last couple of years or so. Is she as into fishing as you are, or is that sort of your thing? Uh, no, she's gotten into fishing, uh, the last couple of years. Like at first it was for, for a long time, it was just my thing. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, we, we went fishing on the Deschutes River once during one of the big, you know, famous fly hatches. And, you know, she's kind of like, uh, I don't know if I'm going to catch anything. And, she, and then she got a fish. Of course. And I kind of changed the game. And like since then, she's been really into it. So it's it's been like an authentic, like incorporation into our lives. And um, you know, now we live in Montana. And there's literally like a trout creek about a block and a half away. <laughs> oh, wow. So we can we can scratch that itch, uh, you know, when the weather is nice or when the, the creek's open. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Is there any place where uh, that you've got your eye on from a fishing standpoint that you want to get to by bike that you haven't done yet? Um, there's a lot of undiscovered or for us, like undiscovered territory in like Montana. I mean, there's just so many good, good rivers here. So piecing those together, uh, a lot of stuff in, in Idaho. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, we've just barely scratched the surface. There's this route called the Bitter Route 300 that uses the Trail of the Quarter Lanes and connects to gravel roads. And um, a lot of that, you know, is surrounded by by awesome fishing. So I think that's one of the the next trips that we're going to plan on doing. Oh, that sounds awesome. That sounds really good. We we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but to kind of close things out, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the future of bike tourism and what it's looking like from your vantage point. And also what the path less pedaled is going to do in reaction to all of that because i feel like that as you talked about the path less pedaled has evolved over time how is that uh going to be happening vis-a-vis -vis the changes that you foresee with bike tourism so when i talk about bike tourism i'm definitely thinking about like working with destinations and everything uh, and less about the the individual experience of, of traveling by bike i think um we're gonna still see more destinations get on board um you know, for a while, like, you know, tra Travel Oregon or the state of Oregon is really carrying that flag really high and lots of states look up to Oregon. And now that they've kind of um, maybe not been as vocal and visible, um, you know, some destinations are kind of might be like wait and see to see what's happening next. But there's there's still many that are that are into it. Um, I think probably the biggest opportunity is in off road um, destination bicycling. So for areas to realize that, yes, gravel grinding is a thing, you know, maybe we should create some events, but beyond the events, um, kind of somehow institutionalizing these routes. So, for example, um, uh, I'm actually working on another podcast as a, that's different from a, the one that we have, and it's going to focus specifically on the concept of bike tourism. So one episode is all gravel rides. So I just interviewed um, the folks that do Dirty Kanza. Uh, the event promoters and the city and the city officials and the same thing for Barry Roubaix and, you know, the event organizers and the city officials to kind of look at this synergy. And if you look at an event like Barry Roubaix, it's fascinating because so it's a small, small town, Hastings, uh, Michigan. Uh, they have this event, biggest gravel ride in the States. And uh, the city went the step further to actually permanently sign those gravel routes. I mean, to my knowledge, this is like the first first in the country. You know, for uh, for for municipality to see, um, you know, the value of this off road cycling or off pavement cycling event um, and kind of be really supportive of signing it year round. And that's what they're seeing. They're seeing people come do the event during the weekend, but then also ride it year round. And it's become like a destination. 
So I feel I, I think we'll see more of that in uh, varying degrees. Um, but that's that's a fascinating story. I mean, they'll be out on the that's the first uh, podcast episode I'm going to be working on for the the bike tourism specific one. Uh, so that that yeah, that'll be one trend. And for us, it's um, we're always morphing. You know, again, it, it started as a personal blog, then um, you know, working with destinations, and then some influencer work. So depending on uh, the current demand, <laughs> uh, we're staying pretty uh, flexible. Uh, just you know, finger on the pulse, like trying to anticipate trends and and, and fill those fill those gaps. Well, you have been doing that for years and putting out such great stuff. Uh, you can check Russ's stuff out at pathlesspedaled.com. Uh, the YouTube channel, it's that's it's Pathless Pedaled, I assume, as well. Yeah, I, if, you, if you search for Pathless Pedal on YouTube, it should, it should show up. <laughs> it should, it should. Um, and most importantly, perhaps, you have joined the ranks of podcasting, and it is a great <laughs> listen, so go check that out on your favorite podcast app. I think you're on all the, all the SoundClouds <laughs> and the Stitchers and all that other stuff as well. That's the Pathless Pedal podcast. Russ, thanks so much for joining the Pedal Shift Project. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album, track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available. <laughs> <laughs>